Canada Infrastructure Bank, or CIB. The CIB has a commitment to invest $35 billion. Last month, you may have seen they announced $970 million towards Canada's first small modular nuclear reactor, their largest investment in clean power to date. As an aside, SMRs are a big area of interest to the government of Alberta, and Alberta Innovates are signatories to Canada's SMR action plan. CIB, of course, has several priority sectors, as well as a target to invest a minimum of $1 billion in partnership with and for the benefit of Indigenous peoples and their infrastructure. With that, I'd like to welcome Carl Landry to tell us more. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for, uh, to Mark and Kara for inviting um, me to speak here on behalf of the Infrastructure Bank. Uh, Carl Landry, I am the Managing Director at the Infrastructure Bank based here in Calgary, and I lead our uh, practice in investing in hydrogen, clean fuels, and carbon capture sequestration, which I will touch on a bit more in a moment. I do want to talk a bit about the Infrastructure Bank writ large. It's, it's an entity that was stood up in 2017. It's not well understood exactly how our mandate works, despite being around for five years now, and I'm hoping hoping to spend a bit of time talking about how we operate and where we can be useful, ideally enabling some of the projects you guys are working on. So we are an impact investor. Uh, as noted, we have $35 billion of funding available to us, and we're looking to develop new infrastructure projects that deliver our outcomes that are linked to government priorities for the benefit of Canadians. And I'll talk a bit about my sector and, and how some of those, those outcomes are measured. We are a partner to governments, Indigenous communities, and private institutional investors. And we kind of work at two time horizons. We can take a very long approach to our, our, our investing, and we can also do something in a very short term to help enable projects moving, moving forward in, in, a, in an accelerated timeline. We are fundamentally a catalyst to financing. We are not a funding mechanism outright. That is, we are trying to help these projects move forward by crowding in additional private capital. We're part of the capital stack. We're not all of the funding that's going to be required. We are looking to finance infrastructure projects that have revenues and create savings for Canadians along our outcome measures. And we are trying to be that low cost financing solution that help get your, get your project built. And what we mean by that is, is we're, we're trying to understand what is the gap or the impediment that's preventing your project from moving forward. And on the spectrum of where the CIB sits, and I'll touch on it in a bit, you know, we're, we're very much large scale project finance, project development, and, and we're trying to help underwrite those gaps that exist. And there's many structural reasons in Canada why some of these gaps exist, and I'll, and I'll touch a bit, bit on them later. But we're really trying to understand how our, our financing unlocks a project. We are a team of infrastructure investment experts or professionals. The bank is about 100 people. It is based in Toronto. There are offices in Montreal and Calgary, each covering different, different sort of sectors. As noted, we have five big buckets of investment that we're working on. Public transit, clean power, green infrastructure, which is where my energy transition effort fits, broadband, and trade and transport. And you can see some notional uh, investment amounts uh, listed along the top. We do have to deploy $35 billion. The bank mandate is technically set to expire in 2028, so relatively quick, ideal, ideally, uh, opportunity to deploy capital on, on behalf of Canadians to, to unlock some of these projects. We do have a very significant component of our financing targeted towards uh, Indigenous infrastructure uh, for the benefit of Indigenous peoples, and my colleague out of Ottawa who leads that has done some really exciting work uh, on different sized projects right across the country uh, that for the benefit of Indigenous peoples. We also have project acceleration fin financing, and this is for supporting uh, governments with early works uh, assessments and analysis. $500 million can unlock an awful lot of early project financing, and we try to play an active role there, deploying capital early and upfront to help people understand what their project could be and how it could benefit Canadians and what additional financing sources could be available from the CIB or otherwise. We are looking to do projects across the country, um, and very importantly, we're trying to crowd in private capital. That was the bank's mandate at the outset and we're having success. We've deployed $7.6 billion of CIB funding, which has unlocked another $7.7 .7 billion in private institutional investor capital, along with additional $6.3 billion in other public partners, so other pr provinces or municipalities. 
So $22 billion of total capital deployed right across the country in a variety of projects, which I'll touch on momentarily. Here's a little sample of some of the things we've done, and maybe in the top right corner under trade and transportation, $466 million for Alberta's largest ever agricultural irrigation expansion. This is to the south of, of Calgary. This was the first project undertaken by the Infrastructure Bank, uh, our major project. It is led by my colleague Jody, who, who leads our agricultural value add, which is also based here in Calgary. Really exciting project, very substantial infrastructure investment that would not happen without capital that looks like the CIBs. We are also very active in public transit, uh, net zero buses. You may have seen an announcement from the uh, city of Calgary last week. Our CEO, Aaron Corey, was in town, along with Mayor Gondek, uh, announcing a, a additional expansion in the electric bus fleet that could be available to Calgarians. In clean power, an interesting project uh, on top of the uh, SMR announcement uh, from a couple weeks ago, which is very impactful, is the Oneida Energy Storage Facility. It's the largest battery storage uh, project in North America at present in uh, southern Ontario. Very exciting role we played there and sort of be an early catalyst to drive additional capital formation to help get that project stood up. So we cover a, raw, a broad range of things in the economy. We could take a very different approach to helping underwrite and evaluate risks as it relates to the revenue model. We can play right across the capital stack, whether it be senior secured, subordinated, preferred equity, equity. I have a fair amount of tools at our disposal. It's about finding the right tool that will help get the project moving forward. So not your typical ROI. So how does the bank work? We're focused on being an investment uh, and, and a, uh, investing is a catalyst for transformational infrastructure in Canada. So we don't have a, a specific return requirement. What, what I have is a requirement to get repaid over the life of the loan. I also don't have an intake process. It's, it's continuous. If you have a project that fits our criteria, you come talk to me or you talk to one of our project development leads and we'll help you find the right person or right group within the bank to get, to get your project uh, evaluated. We fill in the investment gap in, in capital structures for new projects. We can, as I noted, play in a bunch of different parts of the capital stack to figure out what is the right tool and what is the right level of concessionality you need to help your project move forward. It has to deliver on project target outcomes. These are GHG reductions for green infrastructure, daily ridership for our trade and transportation, broadband penetration, trade growth, agricultural value at indigenous infrastructure. Those are our metrics for how we assess the effectiveness of our capital deployment. That's how we screen and rate our ability to deliver outcomes for Canadians against those metrics. Our investment decision making and oversight is entirely governed by the CIB Board of Directors, so it doesn't go through the usual Treasury Board approval process. We submit a five-year rolling corporate plan. Within that, we add new sectoral uh, elements every other year, depending on need. And once it's in there, we can go about our business with the board of directors providing the oversight and the actual approval process. So fairly efficient in terms of decision making to move a project forward. We are complementary yet distinct from other governmental uh, programs. We, we work collaboratively with SIF, with Enercan. Uh, we try to be uh, proactive with EDC and BDC. We know it can be very difficult given all the different um, funding agencies available both provincially and federally. We try to work as collaboratively as possible across all of the different agencies to work and, and provide a sort of a unified approach to helping your project move forward. We do provide an advisory role for some public um, sector projects, but you know, f we, we are more there as an enabler to help them figure out what, what may be next and what may be you know, the art of the possible. And one of the things I'm most excited about how the, the CIB operates is we are trying to crowd in private capital. Uh, I spent 20 years in the private sector. I believe the private sector is the best position to figure out how to get a project built and, and own that risk and that outcome. And we're trying to be the catalyst that gets that, that private capital moving and gets the project uh, uh, built. I put a little screening waterfall together because I, this is how I think about it. This is how I think we bring projects in and I just thought it was kind of a, a simple way to, how does the bank think about screening a project and, and, and how would you think about when that you qualified? So does it fit in our approved investment vertical? Does it achieve our target outcomes and is in the public's interest? 
Does it represent a new infrastructure opportunity in Canada? We, we don't do buyouts. We don't do refinancings. We are here to build new infrastructure for Canadians. Is there a clear investment gap that's preventing the project from moving forward? That's maybe commercial, maybe economic. Maybe there's just an availability gap. There's just not enough capacity to lend to some of these projects. There has to be a revenue stream that it uses to repay CIB's debt and other lenders. So fully repayable, fully amortized. Now that assumes we're not in the equity piece of the business, but generally we, we're a sub-debt investor, subordinated debt investor, which can give you an awful lot of flexibility in terms of making it look equity-like. The project has private capital participation that complements our investment and generally has to be at or greater than our participation. So a one-to-one -one ratio minimum. We can deploy at least $100 million net to the infrastructure bank. So we're talking about the mega projects here. We're talking about the really large-scale projects that we want to help enable in the country. There are some exceptions, however, in building retrofits, in um, EV and hydrogen refueling infrastructure, and as well as indigenous infrastructure. Projects being developed by credible counterparties uh, who can deliver on project execution. We want to get an infrastructure outcome in Canada. It has to result in something being built. Shovel ready with commercial technologies, minimum TRL of eight plus. So this kind of shows you how we're gonna be at the back end of a project. You, you may have gone through the pilot and demonstration phase, now you need to commercialize your technology. This is where the infrastructure bank can play a really large and enabling role. And the project has to be efficient in terms of CapEx and OpEx uh, to generate CIB outcomes. So, so what does that mean? Well, if I can invest a you know, million dollars here and get a thousand tons of GHG savings or a million dollars here and get 10 tons of GHG savings, I should start with the one that offers me the best value per unit of outcome I'm being measured against. And that's just an efficient use of taxpayer dollars. Our due diligence process and timelines. Think of us as private sector from a due diligence perspective, perspective but the ability to bring a concessionary finance toolkit to bear, and I'll talk about that. I mean, we, we are going to look at your project uh, through the same lens the private sector would. I'm going to look at your revenue model. I'm going to look at your major contracts. I'm going to look at the business case, and I'm going to try to understand the market gap. I'm going to engage legal counsel that'll help with the definitive documentation. I'm going to engage a lender technical advisor, so generally an engineering firm with some expertise in the project you're trying to build to put a full package together. It says this is what the project is and this is how we can be supportive of helping it move forward. And you know, at the, along the bottom is kind of how our process works just for more clarity. But the way I, we work is I'm gonna work backwards from when your FID is. When do you need to have certainty of financing and we will be as efficient as we possibly can be to get, make that target with you. So we can work from four to six months to get a financing package in place depending on how complicated it is, which is no longer than I think the public se the private sector would take. Like we, we are efficient, we are looking to be quick and enabler of these projects uh, through our continuous intake process. So that is the bank writ large. I do want to touch on green infrastructure energy transition and, and maybe bring it all back to why the ERA even invited me here to speak. Um, I joined the bank about 14 months ago having spent the bulk of my career in the, in the private sector, uh, most recently at a private equity firm here in town. And uh, why did I join? I think there is a tremendous opportunity for project development in clean fuels, carbon capture, and hydrogen in Western Canada. I think there's also a huge opportunity for small modular reactors in Western Canada. Now from the Calgary office, we cover these sectors nationally. So I'm looking at projects from the Atlantic provinces to the west coast of BC to the northern territories. There are some exciting things happening but there is a tremendous opportunity in CCS, clean fuels, and hydrogen in our country, and there's a very exciting opportunity in the western provinces. CCS is going to be developed in Alberta first. It's already here. Clean fuels and our agricultural feedstock is here. Hydrogen, we are already one of the largest producers. I think Suncor is the largest hydrogen producer in the country. We have a lot of exciting things we can do here with our natural gas feedstock. So, it's an opportunity for us to unlock some of these great projects on behalf of all Canadians with us sitting here in Cal Calgary trying to be that, that enabling capital. We have a very durable competitive advantage in these sectors as Canadians, and that's what I think is exciting. You're going to see sequestration opportunities in Alberta, Saskatchewan. You're going to see um, hydropower in both Quebec and BC utilized in other hydrogen or clean fuels oppor uh, opportunities. The prairies have such a strong agricultural base. 
there's a tremendous number of things that we can do as the bank to enable these very significant projects in Western Canada and quite frankly across the country. And it is one of the big reasons I joined the Infrastructure Bank, why I'm working and spending so much time with my, my new colleagues at the ERA, at Enercan, at Can, wherever we can to be helpful and be useful. That's how the bank's gonna operate. We wanna help build projects with all the people here in this room that maybe have something that needs a couple hundred million dollars of concessionary financing to get first of a kind or an expansion of existing uh, demonstration facility built. I'm unfortunately not able to be here this afternoon for the roundtable, but um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to spend time with anyone that may have questions on how the bank works. Uh, welcome the conversation and, and very much thank you for your time this morning and the opportunity to present.